This is going to be a very brief tutorial on immunocytochemistry and immunohistochemistry. Uh, one of you recently sent me an email uh, saying they didn't really understand it, and it reminded me that there were a few students last year who didn't quite get a grasp of what these two techniques um, are, immunocytochemistry and immunohistochemistry. I think most of you uh, get the idea that both of these techniques allow us to take a look at proteins uh, inside the cell. But exactly how we do that is sometimes uh, not clear in the book or in the literature. So first of all, what's the difference between the two? Immunocytic chemistry is when you dissociate tissue, let's say you take some brain tissue from a mouse that you've, uh, you've kind of sacrificed and mush that tissue up and spread it out in the culture dish on some kind of substrate that allows those cells to grow and proliferate. Uh, you're doing, and, and then you want to look at proteins in those cells, you're doing immunocytochemistry. So cyto meaning cell. So you're looking for proteins inside those cells. Immunohistochemistry is the same principle, except instead of looking at cell cultures, you're actually looking at tissue slices. And you can do this um, a, a few ways. You can use frozen tissue and slice it with a, a microtome, or you can do paraffin embedded tissue and use a vibratome. And you make these very, very thin slices of, of uh, brain tissue or sections of brain. In both cases, you're going to treat these tissues with some kind of reagent that allows you to penetrate. Um, you fix them in, in say, paraformaldehyde or, or, or some other substance, and then you use some kind of substance to, to allow you to penetrate those cells and get to the proteins that you're looking for. Now we get to the part that's a little confusing for people. So what do we use to identify these proteins in the cells that we're looking for? Well, typically, and, and certainly the, the technology has far exceeded this very basic uh, explanation at this point, but this is what's typically done. So uh, we have a number of different uh, approaches to look for proteins. Uh, very commonly, we'll use what's called a polyclonal antibody. So here that, see that here, polyclonal. So how are those made? What they do is they inject into a rabbit or a donkey or a goat or a horse, they inject an antigen. Now most of you should have had some exposure to what is meant by an antigen. So an antigen is a toxin or some other substance that elicits an immune response in the animal that's been exposed to the antigen. So you want to look at, for example, a G protein coupled receptor, you're, that will be your antigen. And, and you want to look at a human G protein coupled receptor. So you take um, a small portion of that receptor and you'd inject it into an animal, let's say a rabbit or a horse or a donkey, and then that animal um, generates an immune response. So here are the B cells from this rabbit that then are generating an immune response. They're being they're they're learning to recognize this one recognizes this antigen, this epitope, which is just something hanging off an antigen that uh, will trigger a response from this particular B cell. And so the epitope is where. Um, the antibody attaches. And so you here have this B cell that's, you know, attaching itself to this particular uh, epitope. And here on the same antigen is a different epitope, and this B cell is recognizing that. So what happens then is that a number of different memory B cells are created that recognize different epitopes on this antigen. Now these B cells, these immune cells, are producing subst substantive quantities of um, of antibodies against different antigens, uh, different epitopes on this antigen. And these antibodies are secreted, and so the serum is collected from the animal in which the antibodies are raised and isolated from the cell material, and the serum contains the antibodies. The thing to remember about the polyclonal antibodies is that they're not specific for one epitope. Rather, these antibodies are going to recognize a number of different epitopes on this particular antigen.
On the other hand, you have the production of monoclonal antibodies, which in fact are very specific. How you generate those is you kind of start the same way. You inject the antigen into a mouse, and the mouse produces those B cells that then start producing antibodies. Now, one of these plasma cells will um, produce antibodies against one specific antigen. What you do then is you take tumor cells that, as you know, will keep proliferating on and on, making multiple copies of itself, and you fuse this tumor cell with these plasma cells that are producing antibodies. And again, this plasma cell is producing one very specific um, antibody to a very specific epitope. So you fuse these two together, and you're going to get a cell that produces a specific antibody for a specific epitope. And then these hybridoma cells then will go on to pr proliferate and make an endless supply of these monoclonal antibodies. So here's just a cartoon kind of depicting that. You have a polyclonal antibody uh, that's been raised against an antigen with a number of different epitopes. So this is, you know, these are identifying one epitope, again, a different type of epitope here. This would be a polyclonal antibody. Your monoclonal antibody recognizes just this one particular um, epitope on the antigen. Then what you do is you take your antibodies and you take your cell culture here, or your tissue culture, whatever whatever you've done, and you expose your cells, you, you again, you allow them to be ten penetrated by the antibody, you expose the cells to the antibody for the particular protein you're looking for, um, give it enough time to adhere to the specific epitope that you've designed it or someone has designed it for, and then you do a rinse. So how does that give us these beautiful uh, pictures that we're seeing of different proteins inside neurons and astrocytes and microglia? Well, you use what's called a secondary antibody. That would be this structure here. And what we've been using a lot lately in neuroscience and most of the sciences are these fluorescent secondary antibodies. So you take um, an, an uh, antibody that's been raised, let's say, in another animal that has been um, linked to a fluorescent protein. And after you've, I, after you've incubated with your first antibody and rinsed, then you incubate the tissue with the secondary antibody that will recognize this first antibody. So let me kind of go over this. So let's say you have a polyclonal antibody. that's been raised in rabbit. Let's say you have a, a, a rabbit anti-G protein coupled receptor there. Then you have an antibody that's been raised in donkey that's been linked to green fluorescent protein. And it's been raised in, in donkey, but it's against rabbit. So here you have a rabbit antibody against a human G protein coupled receptor rabbit against human, and then you have a donkey secondary antibody coupled to a fluorescent tag that's been raised against rabbit. So you have donkey anti-rabbit recognizing the rabbit, and then you have rabbit anti the human receptor. Companies have also created the this um, and they've created antibodies with direct immunofluorescence in which the fluorescent tag has been linked directly to the primary antibody. And so it's just a one-step method. So here's the result of something like that. Let's say you've done, um, you, you want to identify G protein couple receptor 40 in a neuronal cell culture. So you'll use the antibody against G protein coupled receptor 40 and then you incubate it with a green fluorescent secondary antibody and you end up with something that looks like this. But let's say you want to know whether these antibodies, um, whether this, this uh, G-protein coupled receptor is expressed in neurons or is it expressed in astrocytes. You use a second antibody that's against, let's say, a neuronal specific protein, nu N, which is expressed in 
the nuclei of neurons, or you use a second antibody against astrocytes, in particular GFAP, which is an intermediate filament protein that's expressed in astrocytes. And here, that's exactly what's been done. You don't do this in the same culture. You can do it in the same culture, but in here, it's two different, two different um, cultures or two different pieces of tissue. This being the neuronal marker that's been double labeled with the G-protein coupled receptor. And with nice uh, fancy optics, then you can merge the two. And you look at, so you see these yellow um, items here, which are nuclei that are expressing both the new N, the neuronal marker, and your G-protein coupled receptor. And so you can kind of, um, w with, with a certain degree of certainty, say that these cells here are co-expressing both the neuronal marker and the G-protein coupled receptor marker. And so probably what you have here, or what you have here in fact, are neurons that are also positive for this particular receptor you've been interested in. Conversely, you're taking a look at this other tissue that you've double labeled with your astrocyte protein, the intermediate filament protein, and this is in red here. And then when you merge the two with your fancy camera optics, you show that you have these green, um, what look like nuclei, right, that are positive for your G-protein coupled receptor 40, but they do not appear to merge with the astrocytes, with the GFAP, the intermediate filament protein. So here you can say pretty much that, that this G-protein coupled receptor is not expressed in astrocytes. So, you know, you, you have a study that shows co-localization of this receptor with neurons, but not with astrocytes. And in this particular experiment, then you can say that this receptor is specific for neurons. Now, this is a very bare bones um, kind of uh, illustration of how you use antibodies and how they're made. It's very, very basic, very brief and incomplete. But hopefully then you can go back to the textbook or back to the readings and kind of have a better sense of, of how uh, these antibodies are generated and how we use them uh, to look for proteins in brain tissue.